So I would like next to introduce our next speaker. Uh, and by the way, um, this, this whole conference and summit is being recorded and we will find a way uh, for you to access uh, the recordings. So if you want to re-watch or re-listen uh, to any of the, the sessions, you will be able to do that. Um, we will inform you about how that will work. Um, my next speaker is Bruno Kitoko. Um, I'll just quickly go over his bio so you have a little bit of an idea who this uh, gentleman is and his brother in Christ. He's a passionate expert in e-governance. So this is a completely a little different uh, approach. Bruno has solid skills in statistical analysis and is developing proven abilities in the implementation of intervention strategies and operational planning based on the results of statistical data analysis. I apologize, uh, Cedric, this is tough to translate. <laughs> Driven by the only concern to enlighten the Democratic Republic of Congo and Africa, he says he will fight corruption until his last energy. So he is really dedicated. Trained as an economist, he has five years of experience in the management of an electronic governance project in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He always advocates transparency and equality. I add, because I have found this in Facebook, Bruno is married, has a wonderful little daughter, um, and uh, the pictures on, on Facebook are just beautiful. Bruno, uh, are you here? Sean, can you unmute Bruno and, and see if he's here? Yes, I am. Hello. Oh, wonderful, Bruno. Perfect. Sean will, will show the presentation. And as soon as that is ready, you can just go ahead and start. With... So do I have to share my screen I think directly Sean, here? I think Sean will bring it up and make my, my video disappear, if I'm correct. Is that right, Sean? Correct. Right. I'm bringing up the screen now. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, just in the meantime, I can again inform our French speakers. Uh, pour les Français, si vous voulez nous rejoindre dans uh, la pièce pour la traduction, vous cliquez sur Breakout Room en bas. Il y a un onglet où vous voyez French. Et, uh, vous pouvez rejoindre ce groupe-là. Merci beaucoup. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to do this presentation in this uh, uh, fantastic submit. So uh, as the, I was presented, I was introduced, I'm Bruno, I'm from DRC. And then, yeah, so um, I'm a passionate expert in e-governance. So when I was told that I should uh, speak about education for combating corruption, I had a lot of thought in my brain and on my way uh, from where I'm living to where I am now because I'm out. So suddenly something have happened in Kinshasa. Kinshasa is the capital of Democratic Republic of Congo. So um, the national minister of education was jailed last week because of corruption. And today we are talking about education for combating corruption. I'm taking this uh, story just to show how bad it is, how deep corruption is it in Congo and how this is killing all the values. The first element we have to mention here is to know that corruption in Congo is coming from the top to the bottom. That's the first thing we have to mention. I mean, most of the authorities are corrupted. This is the national minister who is jailed because he took $2 million money that was supposed to pay the teacher's salary. 
And this is how corruption is moving from the ministers to the teachers, from the teachers to the students, and it starts to kill all the values. I don't know how much you guys know more about Congo, but most likely when people they hear about Congo is war, shooting people, lack of uh, uh, good health system, poor education, and so on. And then in 2016, we came to implement an electronic governance in Congo. When we came with that, we were wondering ourselves, what should we fix for now to start? Should we fix the health system? Should we uh, uh, fix the education system? But we saw all these are just effect. Still, there is a source of all these problems. And the source was lack of good governance in Congo. So this lack of good governance was due to corruption. From, my, from the university, I was hating corruption. That's why you saw in my profile, I said, I will fight until my last energy because I never been familiar to this practice, corruption. Then we sit it together with my colleagues from Norway and we have discussed. So we came to this kind of a solution. The way for us to combat corruption is to set up a digital governance system. As this is coming from the top to the bottom, once we digitalize everything from what we are receiving as services from the government, then easily we will combat corruption. That's why we said how to fight corruption through digitalization. And this, what I'm telling you here is the true story. This is what I, I, I have been working through since the last six years. The e-governance, as you can see, is exactly following the UN SDGs. And in this project, we have just picked eight points of them. It's known that without peace, without justice, and if we don't manage to bring strong institutions, we can't reach any of the 17 or the 18 SDGs of the UN. And we say we should focus on that as well. Make sure that we, we build strong institutions based on peace and justice, equality to everyone. How now to build this? Bruno? Yes, please. Can, can, you, can you see the slides? No. Oh yeah, I can see them now. Would you would you please advise Sean uh, on which slide he should go because he's he's searching to trying to find where you are. <laughs> Thank okay, you. so uh, please, Sean, can you go to the? Do, do you have the slides? Do you want to share directly? Yeah, I I can share directly. Okay, can we try that? I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. I think that you can see. Yes, please. Right. So, yes, I was talking about this 16 SDG, the 16th one. This is the main SDG. If we succeed in this SDG, we will succeed on the rest of the SDGs of the UN, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. And that's exactly what the e-governance project is following in Congo. This is just showing uh, the team how we are working in this project. We have one team in Norway, and we have another in Congo, another one in, in India. This cooperation is helping us also to succeed. And as I used to say, I consider this as my, my grandmother kitchen, which usually has three stones. And if you remove one stone, it cannot be possible to cook food. So we need also to trust, to cooperate, to make sure that we succeed in this strong mission we have in Congo. 
the project has started in North and South Kivu, the e-governance. So when we came in DRC, we need the get to enter into the country. And as I said, on top, the main problem is lack of governance, good governance in Congo. And this lack of good governance was due to corruption, which is most likely coming from the top to the bottom. So we have interested the leaders in these two provinces. They have approved and we have started. At this other side, we just show um, this uh, corruption uh, perceptions index. And to succeed in such area like this DRC, which is corrupted, to succeed, we came with strategies as follow. This is the team we have started with. 99% of them are young directly from university. We have leaders and we, try, we, 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 we do respect the gender equality as well because corruption, when people, they start to do corruption, they are destroying even this way of respecting women. But in this organization, we say for us to show that there is another way to change and to combat corruption, we need to come all together, men and women, and fight against corruption, which is destroying the good governance in the country. Another element which is sustaining corruption is tribalism in Congo. In Congo, it's normal to be hired as a medical doctor, doctor without having done this as uh, your status. Just because you are a brother to the national health minister or whatever, tribalism. This is sustaining corruption in the country. The reason why we have decided to take people from different tribes and show that from your tribe and mine, we can put the effort together to change the rest of the country by removing corruption and set up a good governance. But also, you know, we have rich people, they are really rich in Congo and poor people, they are really poor. But we have decided to take people from different layers of the society. So the, the two, you see that they are from some rich families and they can accept to work with other people coming from ordinary families and to aim one thing, make sure that there is good governance in the country and combat corruption. So now we come to the reality. When we have reached Congo, we saw this was the picture, the image. From the collection point, this is the implementation of the tax system. What we have identified was the money leakage. And why this? because 90% of the money collected from the collection points to the governmental bank accounts was disappearing. And mainly this was due to the corruption. Because of the corruption, they created difficult system of collection, of tax collection. Because of corruption, they created so many tax that even themselves, they don't understand, they don't know what they want. Because of corruption, they create a, an equal system of collection. And here we came to know that poor people in Congo, I mean, the, the, the tax pressure is, I mean, the poor people, they are feeling this tax pressure more than the rich people. As corruption is coming from the top to the bottom, it's so hard for, for them to go and put the pressure to rich people or on rich people, but they usually come to the poor people without any defense, without any power. And they force them either to pay or to do corruption. Another story, what we, we saw here, and I heard uh, this was said by uh, uh, Reverend, was that you will see a tax officer who comes to you and start to tell you a stupid story by saying, uh, you have to pay $10,000 for taxes. But now I want to help you. And this was this what was annoying me a lot. They come to tell a taxpayer that they want to help him 
And this is the way they, they think they will help him. Instead of paying $10,000 in tax, you pay $5,000. But we give you a document, you will sign $50. And that's how they have killed everything. Now we had to think. And this is the, think, the thinking that came behind and we, come, we came with a solution. The problem was the connection between people and money. When the tax officers, they come to meet with the people, the taxpayers, they start to make harassment, to put a high pressure and to facilitate negotiation. Meanwhile, we should put or set up a digital system that is identifying the taxpayer from when he comes to the, the tax office to when he is making the payments. It's full digital. And we make sure that we remove the people into this process. How are we going to remove the people? No one is going to calculate the tax anymore. We set, we set into the system the law and the rates of the tax. I mean, the tax authorities, they just have to take the information or the declaration that the taxpayer is bringing to them and the system does the rest itself. Then the solution is that the government, if we make sure from the collection to the bank, nothing is disappearing on the way, the government will have more than enough money to invest in roads, in building and so on. Now the question came, is this gonna be possible? to set up a digital system in a country like Congo. Yes, we saw that uh, Congolese, they do have now access to smartphone. And the system we thought, we, we, we thought at that time we need to implement in Congo was inquiring to have such platforms, tablets, PCs, smartphones. And yes, we now have access to these kind of devices. Meanwhile, yes, let's go and do it because there is no other way for us to combat this corruption without going through digitalization. This is how it was working before. As you can see, it's paper at all the steps. And the reality, you see the baskets here, you cannot fulfill this as long as you have this leakage of water. No matter what you do, it will never be full. And this leakage is corruption, is this paper you see here. And I 100% I assure you, the paper I put here, they are all fake documents, but delivered from tax offices to the people. This is inefficient also because it takes 48 hours for you to have just one paper, a tax note, and some other days to make these payments. It's a huge process. And at all, all steps or all levels here, you have to pay corruption to give money. You have to do the negotiation. And we say, this is the problem. And this is what we have to block for us to ensure that these people are not exposed anymore to bad tax authorities who are asking them corruption. We need to digitalize. So we remove the papers. Sudden, once you reach a tax office, you do a declaration, they just collect the data. Once they approve, it goes to the controller and this one is also gonna approve. It comes to you as an SMS. You don't need to go to all these offices. And you have to choose either you make your payment on phone or you go to the bank, you make your payment. So we remove that contact between people and people who are handling money because that was the problem. We just leave them to read the data and make decision. That's now the really electronic governance. The ego of modules here, we also, we, we have seen that corruption is killing even Congolese or human rights. Like in Congo, people, they are living without identity. We don't have at all. Having a passport in Congo is luxurious. Like it's horrible to have a visa to come into Congo. 
all this is because of corruption. And we have we, we found the only way to fight to combat it here is to set up a digital system and to have young people well educated to follow this. So by developing all these models, we want Congolese to start to have access to them. So the more they are accessing, the higher the quality of their identification will become. Because at all this stage, we are taking the picture of the person that are inquiring the services from the government using this system. And suddenly, in the future, we will start to do the facial recognition. So we do secure. And it brings the new application we are launching very soon called MIGOV, which means my ego. This is enabling the citizens to access to their own information on the phone, to everything they are requesting or they are making as payment to the government. So it increases human rights. And it's going to also issue the identification to the citizens. The president also of the country is a citizen. He's gonna have the same identif the ident identification coming from the same system to a normal citizen in Congo. So we start to feel equality. We are equal now with this system. So the sustainable and developing fast system. We have signed our contracts in uh, one of the provinces. This is South Kivu. And in one week, we have configured everything. We have trained the users and the banks. And in that one week, the government were able to see the report automatically. And as you see these people sitting in the middle here, before the digital system, their table were full of papers. But now they can access in just a week, they can access to the system using tablets and it goes fast. So we do the same in the hospitals. And here, this is, this is where Congo citizenship is, is starting once you are born in Congo. Normally within 19 days, they have to give you a paper called a um, birth certificate from the government. And most of the time they were harassing moms before they give them the document. It should be given for free normally. But what we have seen before they give that document to such a madam, they will start to ask her money. And uh, most of these madams, they know I'm living in Congo. So for some reasons, they are not well educated. And so they don't care about that, those papers. They don't know what is it for. This is my child. I'm done with the hospital. I can go back at home with my child. I have no problem. But when the child starts to grow, then he will understand that he has lost his citizenship sudden when he was born not because her mom want the child to lose the citizenship but because one guy came to ask corruption to the mom and the mom did not understand what was that that's why we have decided also to digitalize the birth registration process in congo and this is fighting much more against the corruption in that area because we are providing this for free in congo and all the moms are feeling comfortable. But also we are generating statistics to the government once this is done in the hospital. By giving the statistics, it comes with all the information related to the child when he was born, if he comes with disease and so on. We are showing also the problems, how, how the number of madams died on the way to the hospitals, the children died on the way to the hospitals and so on. All these statistics are now really alive. We, we think and we know this is the best way for us to help the leaders also to combat corruption together with the people. Because of this corruption, there was no trust anymore between the leaders and the people. And the e-governance system is trying to rebuild that trust. And uh, in the field, this is uh, in deep Congo, far away. We are sending also people with the smartphones and tablets to do the registration of people. The people in the field, the field in Congo are like not part of Congo. Most of the time, 
they are just known when it's war and so on. And everything is like that because some leaders at top level, they, they love to do corruption. They do not have time to think about the citizens and how to improve their life. But if we start to digitalize, and this is from my experience, when I'm showing this to some of the leaders, they are like, wow, how this have happened? Are you sure you are at this place? And it's true, we have people at that place doing registration of some people in the villages. And in these villages, sometimes we don't have addresses, but once we start to do digital, we are even having GPS, coordination, GP, G, GPS information from that place. So it's easy now to trace, to start to control and to increase the human being life. I have a few questions and we, I have to answer to them. Is digitalization combating corruption? The answer is yes, from my experience. This is how we have started. And uh, just have a look at the picture. This is how we have started. We have started, we were here and after a year, we have reached this amount. And this amount was reached not because some people did not, uh, not because they have added the volume of taxes, no, but because there were so many leakage of money due to the corruption. It has nothing to add the number of taxes. It's about to close all the leakages of money. It's about combating corruption through digitalization of tax system. So is tax money now developing the society. When we came, we didn't have roads in uh, one of the cities in, in Congo, it's called Goma, where I am from. We didn't have roads. And we have started to work with the government and af after a couple of months, they could have more than enough money to invest in the roads you see here. Which means the answer is yes. The tax money can develop the society. Why the society is not developing is not they don't have that much money to do. Why it's because of this lack of the governance, good governance. Why it's because this governance is spoiled with corruption. And reason why you have to combat that corruption. So I come back to what I have said at the beginning. The SDG 16 is the foundation of the rest of the SDGs. If you don't build a foundation, everything will thrumble down. That's why we are also convinced that this SDG is the best. We are trying to build strong institutions in Congo based on justice and peace, when, where everyone will, be, will feel he's treated equal to the rest of the Congolese or of the people in the world. Not to think like, yes, for me to gain life, I must be a minister. For me to have a passport, I must be the son of the president or of a governor. We build strong institutions and the justice to everyone. So this is uh, in short, what I had to present with you, uh, dear friend and gentleman in Jesus Christ. But one important element I have to add here is this. For us to succeed in this, it's not we are that clever, no. But the key element to succeed in combating corruption is to follow all the biblical words, what the Bible is says. Once we start to follow this, we will succeed. As it says in the Bible, that that's the source of all the knowledge the source that's the beginning of all sciences and we are the light of the world we do not have to feel comfortable dwelling in the darkness while being the light i know this is quite it's it's critical and it's a little bit hard for some of my brothers congolese to understand that we have to feel uncomfortable that's why i strongly appreciate a vision of the third way the revolution education which is now to have 
the church to take control, to take over control of the education. As I said, at the school, the teachers are doing corruption. I have presented the team that we are operating with, and I say they are all from university directly, but also I have said that they are not affected with corruption, not to know. But still, there is corruption at university where they are from. How are they not corrupted? It's because of what I told you, corruption is coming from the top to the bottom. A rector who is asking corruption, a professor who is asking sex to a lady before, she, he gives marks to that, that lady. And this is spoiling and killing the society. That's why as Christians, as the light in this world, we have to combat against such values, which are killing and destroying the current society. Thank you very much. And may God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, but you, you should not leave because we have quite some things to talk about <laughs> with you. Thank you. So there, there are questions, uh, obviously. Uh, I have a few here. And I think I, I, will, I will start with, with one from me personally first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I actually have two questions. And maybe some other have that same questions. The f I see. So you're saying basically that eGov has has been solving a wonderful, a, a, a really bad problem, which is corruption in collecting of taxes. But uh, there's there's two two questions that uh, concern the effectivity of that. One is, how do you make sure that the money now that it's collected digitally electronically will not be eaten up by uh internet hackers and digital corruption so corruption just moves to another place where you will have to make sure that that this is still safe so uh the money will not be taken physically but it may be taken digitally <laughs> so you have another problem or oh, the and the other problem i see here is uh, that if you have the big money, the the so we saw the rise of tax incomes for the for the sort the government, which is wonderful, but then of course there will be other people having to handle that money, and how do you make sure <laughs> that they are not corrupt? So they have big money coming in to their cash flow now, and some of them may be be corrupt too. So all the work. Uh, maybe in vain, kind of. <laughs> I'm very negative, I know, but I think we have to tackle these these tough questions, as as this is really a tough topic. Um, and I'm at the same time, I'm really excited about what you what you presented, and I I love the ideas, and I love especially the integration of Christian uh, living character formation on the one hand, and um, e-government uh, perspectives on the other hand. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for these uh, fantastic questions. Uh, first of all, you know, everything is about people. Of course, we are bringing in this digital solution to combat corruption, but technology, technology is not enough. That's what uh, Steve Jobs have said. Still, we need correct people to lead such tools. And that's why I say that I'm really impressed and I like this idea of having the church coming behind this vision to combat corruption. Because we have seen even some churches corrupt, uh, doing corruption in Congo. So for us, I mean, uh, we, we move the corruption from one place to another place, as we say, this can be possible if we have bad people. We still need good people. And by having good Christians, praying a lot, leading such systems, yes, it's possible. And the, the, the second question, what was that again? I don't know if uh, I'm clear with this first one. The first one was the digital problem. So hackers stealing the money digitally, not physically, but digitally. And the other problem was the people at the top 
uh, having the money and uh, now in their in their boxes. And of course, you answered that question. I think the first one you did not really answer yet. Oh, also for, for the second, I need to add one more thing. For, for the second, what I may say, the good thing here, okay, it doesn't matter they eat that money, the leaders, because they have more than enough, they can steal it. But still, the good thing is that with the MIGO, as I said here, now you can control them. You can start to, you start now to control the money you are paying to the government. And you can easily ask a question, like for now we are doing so, several demonstrations in Congo. People are down on the streets demonstrating, but they have nothing to ask. They have nothing to show. Mm -hmm. But with the digital, you can, all of you come sudden on the road and say, here is what I've paid this year. And please, I, I want to see the road. I want to see my children go to school. Even though for now we say that, the, the president or the, the governor can say, I didn't see your money. Okay. So that, that's, what, that's why we, 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 we want everyone to have access to such platform to combat corruption and have access to his own information. It gives him more rights to control the leader as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, and, and, and that's, uh, it's goes the same way for the first one. No matter what, okay, they can do this corruption. It moves from uh, manual to digital, but still they control. The main controller must be the people. Mm -hmm. That's the main controller. It doesn't matter we have the member of parliament and so on, but the main controller is the people. And sudden, since once we have access to all this kind of information, it's easy for us to ask questions now. But also, the system must be steered by correct people, Christians. That's, that's the base. Thank you, uh, Bruno. There is a lot of questions here and there is raised hands. Um, I would like to quickly go to the, start with the first uh, question or uh, this is basically a comment and it's being elaborated. When corruption has become systemic as it is in Uganda with the church also not sure whether they are part of the system of corruption. We need to really think hard regarding how we will root out corruption with education. So this is coming back a little bit to the, the topic of education and the connection of what you presented and what we are here talking about today. This is an education revolution uh, summit. So we are in, in education. So that connection, would you maybe just say a few, give a short answer, please, so we can have more people. Yes, um, education, you know, these kind of uh, tools, we, we, we are not going to school to learn them in Congo. It's kind of a new tool we are putting, we are setting up to combat corruption. Means we also have to educate people this way. Yes. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if, I, if I caught very well your questions or your question. Well, actually, the, the, the discussion then goes on. The, then another gentleman answered, the church in Uganda is unfortunately largely, largely part of the corruption. And then it goes on. Yes, sir, many will agree with you on this, but maybe we need to define corruption from the biblical stance. For instance, is using my position with those in leadership for the work of the church, for example, curriculum change campaigns or leadership workshops, good governance debates, with the very corrupt leaders as chief guests, corruption or working with a system like Nehemiah, Joseph, and Daniel did. So where is the difference between, you know, using influence and corruption? That is, I think, a, a, an important distinction that needs to be made. And we need to, dis we can't di discuss it today, finally, but maybe you want to say a few words on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but before I say, can I ask, um, yes, uh, that's a very important question. But I'm here with uh, one of my mentors, uh, sure. Frank Carlson. Yeah. Oh, Frank can also so, come in if he wants to answer. Oh yeah, uh, Frank, uh, please can you come with uh, some answers, please, Frank? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think this uh, this e-governance project has shown that there is an enormous uh, need for education in all levels. And we have to educate from the, from the kindergarten up to the top level of universities. 
So the backbone of what Vishal and Andreas and all of you are trying to do in this summit here is to be able to uh, pull together all efforts in order to uh, secure uh, that there is a, a, a strong uh, network and a strong group uh, behind this enormous duty of doing corruption. And, and again, this, these tools that have been presented today here by Bruno Kitoko uh, is something that uh, <clears throat> is showing some of the mechanisms, some of the tools, some of the possibilities that can be implemented uh, together with this Kingdom Education Fellowship. Yeah. Uh, uh, Andreas, can I say something? Sure, go, sure, Vincent, go ahead. Uh, one of the books we use in the Institute is a, a book by Professor Jim Collins. It's called Going From Good to Great. A powerful book that I recommend to everyone. And he states clearly the three steps involved in the transformation of every, any sector. The first requirement is you must develop disciplined people first. Character comes first. And then after that, competence. And then thirdly, environment, proper placement and enabling environment. But if you do not have discipline people, it doesn't matter how great the technology is not going to work. They actually will use it to their own advantage. Mm -hmm. And this is where training comes in. Yep. Any church that must actually be a part of this movement, that church must be rooted first in the character of God and, uh, and then uh, help to mold those who are coming to those centers in, in Christ's character before we even impute the skill uh, yes. and the functionalities. Andreas, I just want to add something in relation to the church organizations. Yes. Uh, there is so many very big church organizations all over Africa. They are big, they are huge, and they have one big problem, I think, is that the organization is, is way too big. And it doesn't have to be sad to be corruption, but it it is a way of enormous leakage of money. So that when people give their uh, gift to the church, it's, it's very often that they have not the whole system from the local church to the head of the organization. So uh, again, we have tried many times now to also implement the e-governance into the church system in Congo. And there are, for instance, 96 Protestant organizations covering 49 million people in Congo. And we are currently working on that. We have an agreement with the, with the Protestant uh, church in Congo. Uh, <clears throat> but this have to gradually come into place. Uh, the problem is that um, there are so many church, churches who, who is supporting their past pastors uh, by this system and 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 therefore the the organization have no no function at all the big organization doesn't have a function it doesn't work for the local church it's have become too big that's why there have to be a top down again the same thing in order to have a real top leadership of the organizations in congo you need to have a system there that is helping uh, 10, 30,000 churches to be handled, to be organized. You can't organize if you don't have any overview of the whole organizations. You can't, um, if, if, if all the members of the church organization is not known, it's not registered, it is, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to handle all these members in the church organizations. So we have many different kinds of processes in Congo in, in order to see how we can help these huge church organizations which are left after all the missionaries have gone. Uh, and, 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 and I suppose uh, this kind of thing is also problematic in many other parts of Africa. Hmm. So I have been trying to listen to you and read through the questions a little bit. 
and there is one aspect that is coming up again and again by a few of the questions. Um, and it's, it's the question that, uh, that few have asked, what is the, uh, the amount of resistance you receive from government or other officials uh, for this system? Because obviously this will make some people very poor who lived off of the corruption. So there will probably be some resistance. How is your ex uh, experience with resistance? Oh yeah, uh, uh, very good. Our experience with the resistance. Um, first of all, to me, from my experience, what I know, this is what I'm saying. It's a it's a mission our given from God, like when God says, speaks to to Moses, and uh, so go and uh, tell to Pharaoh to release my people. So at the beginning, I was a little bit afraid when this kind of resistance came and they are coming from all the levels, sometimes from the governors themselves, from the ministers. And uh, this resistance, uh, they, they were even uh, at certain points trying to cost my life. But I strongly believe in God. And as I said, I recognize that I am the light of this world. And I do not have to be afraid because I know the God to whom I believe is stronger than those people. So when the resistance came, sudden I know that I do have God. I also have to resist just to say no to corruption. And what, why am I resisting and why am I succeeding all the time when I'm saying no? I just have to come with the data from the system. And I say, yes, you have right to say what you are saying, but here is the data. See what the data is saying. You shouldn't do that, please, excellence. And when they see the data, no matter how powerful they are, sometimes they feel weak. And um, now uh, that's uh, when, when once they feel weak, they resolve to to try now to destroy or to kill you. That's the that's the problem in Congo. But we cannot fear about that. Dying, we're gonna die. But the important thing is to know how to die. If I'm dying while combating corruption, that's fine. I know I'm going to be rewarded by, what? by, by, by God. Amen. Yeah. So that's, I strongly believe. And the good thing is the people you saw, I presented, we all, we are all committed and that's the way we are working and we are combating this corruption. Of course, resistance come, but we also have to resist because we do have the life God, but also we have the data with us. Mm -hmm. Man. Okay, there's another question here. And I, I think actually Ruben Kigame has been raising his hand. Uh, should we give Ruben uh, uh, freedom to speech? Could you do that, um, Son? I think he would like to ask a question. Ruben Kigame is an apologist and writing a dissertation on decolonization of Africa. Hello, Ruben. I have heard of you, I have not met you yet. You look wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, very quickly, um, thank you so much for organizing this uh, conference. And um, I mean, I'm just so encouraged to see what God is doing across the world. And for me specifically in Africa, um, everything that has been presented is very close to my heart because I wear many hats. But uh, I come to this pretty much uh, at a time I feel suddenly that the Lord has been leading me for two years now to step out and do something about governance in, in our country, Kenya. It may look like a dream right now, but um, it's exciting to see how this conference provides some practical solutions to how we could do governance differently. And so this particular um, topic of e-governance is something we in Kenya have been dealing with for some time now. And uh, we know that, for example, we started to digitize probably two years ago. And uh, two years later, we still don't have what we call our Huduma numbers, you know, the service numbers uh, they're still being rolled out. So if uh, beyond this particular 
presentation, perhaps the questions that our brother asked at the beginning about uh, e-hacking and uh, the, the abuse of the system could be given a bit more thought because yes, it is an excellent solution, but um, you, you still have a long way before we can implement the, you know, the value-based uh, interventions. What, what, is, what is like the immediate um, intervention we could have to prevent that? Because I think it's a good place to start. And uh, maybe you could also comment on how uh, this system could be used for voting in future, because uh, that is where a lot of the violence and civil conflicts uh, emerge. And, and so for the record, yes, I would like to run in next year's election as a Christian candidate uh, for the presidency, uh, probably the first blind man uh, to, uh, to, to vie for the position. But, um, you know, God has uh, given me so much light that I would like to shine into that system. Amen. 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 Would you like to comment, Bruno or, or Frank? Yeah, Frank? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, the, the interesting stuff is that uh, if you want to implement this kind of systems, uh, we, we quickly found out that you can't, you can't go to the top level in the country. You have to start smaller levels, lower levels. So that's why uh, Bruno talked about starting in North Kivu and South Kivu. And you have to have a direct agreement with the top leader in that province. In this case, the governor of South Kivu. And the governor have to be the one who pushed this system in. And the governor is a Christian pastor normally in Congo. <laughs> and you have to push him to implement this kind of thing. And Bruno has not just started in another province in Congo to implement this into the system. It have to happen from the top side on the province side. And it have to be the government itself and the parliament in the local government that have to do this. And then the team or educated team from Bruno can go then in and do the work. Yeah, thank you. You want to add something, Bruno? No, uh, Frank has said all oh, what okay. I was okay. also taking about because having this as uh, the leader's tool. It's fun. We have more interesting questions. I think uh, Olga raised her hand. Could we have Olga uh, to speak, uh, Sean? Olga Mugerwa. Olga, please unmute. You have been permitted to speak. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Vicent. Uh, I hope I'm, I, I can be heard. Yes. Thank you, Bruno. And I also want to thank uh, Reverend Canon, Dr. Senyonyi, the previous speaker. I, I like the presentation by Bruno, and I think we've done a lot of attempts of that in Uganda. And I think someone posted that of the fora. Our, our Revenue Authority has done something like that. Our, National identification card system has done some, but corruption is still rooted uh, that deep. And, and so I didn't know you want to see my face. And so I think that the issue is what is our education system doing about this? What, for me, I'm thinking, what am I teaching from nursery school? What am I passing on to this student, to this young child about being genuine about not being corrupt, about your neighborliness, about I am not going to backstab. We often ask in interviews, are you a team player? But supposing in this office that we are 10 and nine of us are actually people who do not believe in a good value system. So who is the team player? In the revenue system, you'll find three of them in the group. Two of them are agreeing to steal, one of them isn't. So who is the team player? So I'm, I'm asking myself, what is our education? And I know I'm part of the team and I haven't read that book. I have to put a caveat on that. But what is our education uh, talking about in terms of corruption? I'll give an example. I'm a teacher or I'm a lecturer and I go and talk about ethics in business, all right? And I'm teaching these students about ethics in business, but I have a shop where they come to shop and they know my skills are, are not true skills. 
And we know that the, the Bible says that the Lord abhors dishonest skills. But I'm a Christian. I pray. I go to church. I fellowship. I start my classes with prayer and teach about ethics and business. So I think let's let's think through. I like the model, the examples, the interventions, but let's think through what hinders that, even that digital intervention from achieving its objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Um, that was a comment, uh, very helpful, I, th I think. And we will go deeper into all of these topics, obviously. So we are kind of con connecting and collecting uh, a, a fabric of, of topics where government, uh, ethics, uh, learning, and character education ac actually interfere. And there, we see that they are not, we cannot work on them separated. They are all interconnected. Um, so it, it does not help only to install e-government. If you have corrupt people at, at some point in the system, they will find ways of taking the money out. So we need education that forms character, strong character people that have a rigor in, in their um, compassion for truth uh, and for, uh, for transparency and all these things. Um, and there's, there's one more, two more things, questions that are have coming up. Um, we, we really have too many uh, to tackle them all, but um, we, we can continue there. This is only a starting point. I want to say this to everyone who is asking questions, who is bringing in thoughts. Uh, as you can see, this today is the starting of a movement in Africa. And this is, uh, we would like to see very much of this discussion on this level of information. And um, so combining the visionary aspect that Vishal has been bringing this morning and combining the practical aspect that Bruno has been bringing in and, and Frank and, and looking at that together through character formation, university, education, and government, et cetera. This is what we want to do. So this, this revolution is not only about uh, talking words, it's about bringing it to the reality of our everyday life. Uh, in Africa and even in Europe, we need it even more than you in parts of our, you know, of our so we are so corrupt and uh, the rise in corruption in Europe and in America has been a lot stronger than in, in other regions of the world in the last five years. So Transparency International has shown that the corruption index has risen, for example, in Canada, stronger than it has been rising in a lot of countries of Africa, where it has been kind of stagnant or going down a little bit even. So um, I will try to take up there is one more hand raised and forgive me if I maybe oversee someone. It's just hard to tackle. Aris Stark uh, is trying to raise his hand or her hand. I don't even know if this, this is a lady or a, a gentleman, a brother or a sister. Please, uh, would you speak up for a moment? So this is Aris Stark. Uh, Aris Stark, yeah, please unmute. I have yes. yes. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry to have come in very late, but uh, from what I've just heard, let me point out the fact that the gospel of the Lord has been preached. In other words, has been proclaim proclaimed, but in terms of character formation, the church has not helped the character of Jesus to be formed within us as Christians. Yes. In other terms, we have not been taught. And I can, I can say that again, in other terms, science has prevailed, but the message of the Lord has not been able to counterbalance what science is teaching the world. In other words, the prevalent, the prevalent uh, paradigm has been scientific and nothing from, from the Lord or from the gospel has been the basis to organize society in terms of values, in terms of norms. We have not been able to transmit 
what we get from the church to the world. The thing has happened in, in inversely. The word has, has influenced the church. Thank you. Can I leave it that way for, for the time being? Yes, that's a, a great statement. And thank you very much for that. Would you like to comment on that, Bruno or, or Frank? Yeah. Um, yes, uh, that's what I have said. As we, if um, it's, it's correct what the, my brother was saying, as we are the light of the world. And to me, I say, I, I will never feel comfortable dwelling in the darkness as, as, uh, as the light. So I have to share all the values I'm pulling in out uh, from the church and to spread it. And through this way, as I said also, a digital system to succeed need to be led by correct people, especially from the church, knowing the power of the kingdom of God. So uh, this is correct. We do have to spread our values from the churches to the rest of the world. We do not have to let the world come into the church and transform the church, but the church has to transform the world and have this what is really needed. Yes, uh, and, and there are so many churches in, in Africa, as my experience is that they are churches and they are fantastic churches. They are, they are praying a lot. They are worshiping the God and all. But what I'm saying now is that the churches in Africa have to learn to work. They have work, uh, love is hard work. And that's, I think, what Aristark is, is pointing towards, is that, that the point is that hard work. They have to go in and transform the society. The, so the church have to transform the society around them uh, by the grace of God, by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and really do that. And I think that's that's the that's the key point. Yes, Th thank you, Frank. Um, I think as we have been in this meeting for quite a while, I, I would like for now to wrap it up because we have we have um, tomorrow another round of meetings, and I think for now maybe we can we can close the Q and A here. Uh, I would like to re-mention re that there is an online, um, so there's two or three things you can access. Uh, there, there's an online discussion board that we have where you can write your comments at any time and they will stay there. They will not get lost. This is the link to that. It's a, an online notepad where you can just put your thoughts and ask your questions or bring uh, suggestions, any, anything you think is important. And this will stay online as we, as we have even finished this conference. So after the conference, this will be also a platform where, we, where you can put thoughts or invitations or uh, comments um, or also the, the request to connect with someone. Maybe you lost the connection or you don't know the email address or something. Uh, if you want to connect with someone, write it there and we'll try to help you out. So that, that notepad here would, might be helpful. So thank As you. Close out. Um, yes. And I want to appreciate you for allowing INT to host this. That actually, let's remember that one of the major outcomes we want to achieve is the networking of African professionals. Mm, yes. I'm hoping by the time we finish tomorrow, a group of African professionals will begin to own this vision. Yes. And so there were people that we are targeted and specifically invited uh, to be a part of this. I would like before we close to at least give one or two of them, uh, even if it's just 30 seconds, to say something about what they have heard. And so I'm going to call on Dr. Abu Bako. Dr. Abu Bako has an institute in Accra, Ghana. Uh, Dr. Abu, if you're there, please unmute him just to tell us what he has heard and uh, if he, how he feels that this can benefit Africa. He's a very experienced uh, scholar. Please unmute him.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anibogu and um, Professor Vishal. Good to see both of you. And um, can we have your video, please? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hopefully, you can see that now. I uh, let me just <clears throat> do that quickly. Okay. I think you can see me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Don't be deceived. Thank you. He's a very experienced old man. <laughs> Thank you very much for those kind remarks. And um, well, from what I have heard, I see that there is hope for Africa. And my interest is all to know that quite a bit of the education for the whole world actually started in Africa. Uh, and there are documents to that effect. Um, and up till today, we still have almost a million manuscripts that are unpublished uh, from Timbuktu and some of the other places. And the oldest university, as much as we know Bologna, started by the monks in Italy, is considered one of, of the oldest, the actual oldest university is in al Karawin, Fez, you know, uh, Morocco, which is about 1,200 years old. Having said that, what I've heard today, I'm excited about it because I could already see the interface of what we're doing that you know about, Professor Anagogu, where we have a platform, a digital platform for education already that can host 100 to 300 million people at the same time. So if a school comes in as one, then automatically that means, you know, <laughs> almost 100 million or more schools. Mm. So I am looking forward to the way we can interface. And when it comes to the various aspects that we have heard about, let me just say quickly concerning corruption, maybe tomorrow we can interrogate some of these things. Corruption, clearly from what we have seen, whether you're talking of 1 Corinthians 15, 33, or you're talking from uh, Romans chapter eight, verse 19, verse 21 in particular, is basically changing things that have to do with the value of the thing, you know, destroying it, all kinds of things that we could go into, but not now. Mine was just a quick comment. Uh, so corruption is not what we've made it. And by the grace of God, I lectured in economics. I stopped lecturing in 1987 at the Amadebele University, for those of you that are in Nigeria. So I do know what, you know, economically it has been defined to mean. But if you want to be holistic, which is what I see us dealing with, then you're talking about anything that devalues, changes the value, tries to destroy, tries to, you know, waste that's what is called corruption. So we will need to approach it holistically. Then we can deal with all the manifestations of corruption. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Maybe tomorrow we can reinterrogate a few things. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to networking with the great work you're already doing. Uh, Andreas, incidentally, the lady with whom uh, that brought marginal education to Nigeria, working directly with uh, um, uh, the man in Canada, uh, is actually with us. And she's actually the one spearheading education revolution in uh, Nigeria. So I would like Mrs. Alero Otobo. Alero, if you're there, can you just say something for 30 seconds? Yeah, he works directly with Tom Rudmik. I think she's not here now. She was some minutes. Oh, she was. Okay. Alero has, is actually uh, the one in charge of imaginary education in Nigeria, and they've done a great work. Finally, I would like my deputy, Dr. James Magara, please make a few comments before we, we wind down. So it doesn't look like I'm the only one running this thing. Dr. James Magara. I have, I have Mrs. Lona. Should I ask? Okay, let Lona speak if James has left. Thank you very much, uh, Prof.
Prof Anik Bogu for the honor and, and blessing to be part of this um, incredible conference. Um, my quick comments are that we're beginning to see the fulfillment of Habakkuk chapter Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, which speaks about the knowledge of the Lord filling the earth as the waters flood this, as the waters uh, fill the seas. When you look at how we're beginning to come together with a common vision, there will be an outpouring that will flow out again to cover not just Africa, but the whole world. And so for me, it's a real excitement to begin to see that pieces coming together. It's, it reminds me of, of, again, a passage in scripture that talks about the dry bones coming together and a whole army arising. It's like the different visions, the different burdens that God has given us, not just across Africa, but across the world, are beginning to come together. And very soon the Lord will, will pour out his spirit on this corporate body that will then flood the earth. So for me, it's a very exciting time and uh, I'm very glad to be part of it. Um, um, it's a blessing, thank you. And by the way, uh, Lorna is the pro-chancellor of Magere University. So she's speaking even from that capacity. Again, thank you, Andreas. Back to you as you round up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Yeah, I have some internet problems, but I think as long as you can hear me, that's, that's fine. Uh, does Africa need an initi initiative for character building? I think so, in all humbleness. Um, are there good plans out there to achieve that? Yes, there are good plans. There are many plans and there are many initiatives and ideas already out there. We will collaborate. We will work together as we see with EGOV and other uh, initiatives, which, which we would like to collaborate with. Uh, we don't think that we are the first ones to think of this idea. Um, we don't think we are the only ones who know something. We are humble enough to know that there is so many good ideas out there and we acknowledge every single one of them. And we would love to cooperate and collaborate and assist any goal. Um, still, why is, it, is the new initiative needed? And I would like to give you three reasons to finish uh, this today's sessions. Three reasons why uh, a new education initiative like the third education revolution or the Africa education revolution is needed. One, it tackles the problem at its root. That is one of the most important things that um, only if you educate the next generation, scientists, leaders, politicians, business owners, entrepreneurs, artists, musicians, painters, uh, writers, whatever it is, only if you educate the next generation of leaders and all of these people, will you be able to change tomorrow's face of a nation. And that's exactly what we aim at with, with our education revolution. We say we will, we will need character formation at the very basis of where people live. And it will happen at not somewhere in a distant place, but it will happen where they live close to their church. So we want to have the church, we envision the church to be, be to re uh, discovering its role as a character formation uh, industry. <laughs> this is the church's industry, form character, <laughs> yes. develop character. Mm. So if the church has lost this idea of developing character for society, not for itself, but for society to change nation, then we are tackling the root uh, of, of a changed nation. Because uh, I have always been talking, I, and I've been teaching business psychology for years, and 
and people have been asking me, so what is the, what if you would summarize the main thing about what is hiring the right people? And I say, well, obviously I have a ton of uh, measurements, instruments with that, that I can, uh, that I can explain to you and I can show you where you can find all the, the, the specialties and the, and the giftings and everything of the people. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is if you have two people in front of you, one person has a lack of knowledge or skills, but a straight character, and the other person has the best abilities and skills you can find on the planet, but a flawed character, I will always choose the person that has the right character and develop him or her. So at the end of the day, it comes down to the question, character development is going to change a nation. And only if we have people that are uh, that have integer, or what is the English word for that? Maybe we shall uh, want to say. I uh, missed the last word. It went silent. <laughs> yeah, so he how, has how some problem. He has some problem with the internet. So, so what, what was integer, integer, whatever, uh, integrity. You know, the a good question would be how did Protestant nations succeed in building strong character and strong educational institutions? So in a country like Holland that I describe in my chapter on uh, economics, etc., cetera, the key was that every child until 50 years ago for 400 years, every child had to memorize Heidelberg Catechism, which included memorizing 10 commandments. And that's what Luther began. Luther wrote his shorter catechism was what children memorize and his longer catechism was teacher's training. So every pastor had to master the longer catechism, which explained uh, what commandment you shall not steal, you shall not covet, what did they mean? So in fighting corruption, to see that coveting, when you're taking a bribe, you are coveting money. When you're taking bribe, you are stealing. Uh, you're not using a revolver or a knife, but you're using your pen. A bureaucrat, a civil servant, a politician is using his authority to sign is using his pen to extract money, whether it's from individuals taking bribe or looting state treasury. Uh, that was the question that Andreas had asked uh, uh, the previous speaker. Uh, okay, the government collects all the money, but what if the treasury is being looted uh, by politicians and military, military officers, you're buying guns or ammunition from another country and you're taking, inflating the invoice, taking a lot of bribes. So you're looting your own treasury. Um, and what, how this was changed was through catechism, 10 commandments being ingrained in every child. And I have, a little bit of it in the book, Truth and Transformation and in other books, uh, but uh, recently uh, all the collected works of Abraham Kuyper on economics and uh, business, they have been published in England uh, to understand how the Protestant movement uh, transformed nation, built character, this is what we have to recover, which evangelical theology has lost. Our seminaries are not interested in understanding the Bible's impact, the gospel's impact on whole nations and societies. So uh, I would say that as we uh, go on with the study, we really have to free ourselves from the influence of a lot of systematic theology, which does not even understand what happened at Reformation. 
what was Refor Reformation all about. And uh, so there is a whole uh, revolution of biblical theology that has to happen. And much of what we are saying is that the evangelical theology, including Pentecostal and charismatic theology, are not Protestant theologies that build great nation. That's a very provocative statement, but I'm uh, pro provoking us to begin to look at our own uh, uh, theological tradition, which is which needs reform, which needs transformation. But I'll stop there. I'm back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I lost connection. Can you still hear me now again? Yes. Did you hear my first point? The tackling at the root character formation. Did you yes. hear most yes. of that? Yes. Okay. I, the second point sum up is it, it builds uh, on, a re, on a resource that is unique in Africa, actually. This revolution that we're envisioning is not building on, on a, a brick and mortar uh, university buildings. It does not need necessarily a lot of new uh, buildings, but it needs churches. And Africa, at least sub-Saharan Africa, has many churches. So uh, the, the number of churches in the US and in, in Western Europe is declining. Churches are closing. Here we have less churches every day. Uh, p churches are being sold. You can go in Germany and buy a church and open a restaurant in a church because churches are not being used anymore. There's no one in there. In Africa, it's different. The churches are there. They're all over. And so we are, we are, we are, our revolution is, is um, focusing on churches, which is a resource that Africa has. God has raised a strong church in Africa. Obviously, some of the problems that Vishal has just been pointing to, which uh, the Western church has created and then exported to other nations, um, which is bad, we also have to tackle that. But at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity that is very great. The third uh, point I would like to make, uh, why and how is this needed and why is it needed? We, we can use, we, we, in today, we have technology at our disposal that we would not have had 10 years ago. So if you look at the, the number of um, uh, mobile phone connections in Africa and the rise of that number every year, it is immense. Uh, and that is going to continue over the next years. So technology is, is on our side and it's helping us to really uh, to, to get this uh, revolution realized. So we, we are coming, I think the Lord has prepared this for a long time. Uh, and, and maybe you, you now sit here as many have already asked, how can I get into this? So how can I become part of this? What can I do? Uh, and there is a few things I would like to point out that you can do. One, we need you to pray for this movement. We need a whole warrior group of prayers behind this because obviously uh, the forces of darkness will not love this because this will bring light to nations. It will bring light to nations. It will bring, it will dispel darkness. And that is not going to be loved by the enemy. So we will need a lot of prayer. Uh, and, and I envision having prayer groups, uh, not only uh, in Europe or in Africa, or it's, I envision it being in, in many, many places. I envision hundreds of prayer groups praying for the education revolution to be taking over education and by that transforming nation in order to, to raise a new generation of leaders uh, and, and not only leaders, citizens, uh, workers, uh, farmers, uh, any, anyone. So th this is the first thing that we would need, your prayers. We need a prayer movement behind this. Otherwise, it will just be a lot of smoke. It will disappear tomorrow. We need prayers because we need the Lord's presence and the Holy Spirit's presence in everything we do. We need his correction and guidance. So the second thing we need is we need you to ponder and to pray about 
how you can be bringing your gifts into this movement. How can you, if, if the Lord has touched you and or is touching you right now and speaking to you, that, that you feel there is something resonating with, with what the Lord has been doing in your life, pray about how you can contribute with your gifts. Uh, and I'm not talking about finances. I'm going to talk about that later. But about your gifts uh, concerning what you, your abilities, your skills, uh, and, and everything that's concerned with this. And the third thing uh, I would like to point out how you can contribute and become part of this is actually to my personal uh, flavor, there is much too many white faces here. I would like to see uh, three white faces and 20 black faces, colored African faces, whatever uh, your skin color may be, African faces. And this will be an African movement. It needs to become an African movement. It's not our movement. We are just here to assist you. If, you, if, if we can be of any help, we are here to help you uh, and, and to be alongside you. So we, we would like to see African leaders rise up and take this as their responsibility to educate Africa and to bring back uh, the renaissance of the Christian mind of the African mind, which is the topic for tomorrow. Um, and I encourage you to be there tomorrow because you will get more information that you have not heard of anything today uh, when you come tomorrow. And, and even I would consider you, have you consider reserve the dates in August for a physical meeting. The Lord willing, we will gather physically in August uh, and it would be great to have all of you, plus two or three times as many, uh, come together and really develop this. Um, another thing that you can do is you have networks. So you may not realize that the people that you know, just the men and women that you know, are one of the, probably one of the greatest gifts you have, because Look at it simply as, the, as, as this, like this. You know a person who I do not know. So I could never connect to that person. I could not go up to that person. I could not invite that person. I could not tell that person about anything uh, that, we were, that we are doing here. But you are a person who, who knows another person. And your network, that is the persons you know around you, is what we would ask you prayerfully to consider if you can invite them into this movement. Because it will take many, many more than we are here. I mean, to be honest, I'm overwhelmed by the number of people we are here. But still, this is only the beginning. And it will need many, many more than us in order to really get this movement going. Two last things. There is a question that has come up. Uh, what is the dates in, in August? Um, and maybe someone who can check in the calendar quickly from the team and, and get that to me uh, in a minute. But I would also encourage you to start reading. If you have not read books by Vishal, uh, start reading. And you may start with the third education revolution, which is the topic we're dealing with in this conference, in this summit. But you may also want to start with another book. It basically, it doesn't matter because it will plunge you into the kind of thinking that reconnects church and society. And that is the biggest problem that we have in the church, that there is a disconnect between church vision and mission work and evangelism and all that, which is good. I'm a pastor myself. I'm a church planter myself. So it, it, this is not bad at all but it needs to be reconnected to our task in society. So we need to really rethink what is the role of the church in society. And behind me there here, Truth and Transformation, that is the English version of the book. You see it's standing right there. This is, this is the book uh, that basically explains, it's, it's a pre-book for the third education revolution. And there will be another book coming we are preparing and hopefully many of you will contribute writing chapters, is uh, the church and the healing of the nations. And maybe Vishal will talk about that tomorrow a little bit. Uh, 
Thank you, Vincent. The, the, it's August 2 to August 7. That is the date in, uh, in which we plan, uh, the Lord willing, to gather in Africa. Um, so th this would, was my roundup. And I think Bruno uh, and also Ruben raised their hands. Maybe we can give them just a minute each so you can, you can contribute quickly. Bruno. Uh, yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, what I just want to say, I, I am receiving so many questions here now, which uh, are, which seem to be very interesting. And I just want to promise you that I will come later with the answers. I have to write the answers to all these questions and uh, you're gonna find a way how I can share this with everyone. Either yes. I just published it here in this group or we find another way. But I just want to ensure everyone that I will come back with the, with the answers to all the questions I'm receiving. We will come up with a way, bro. No, no problem. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Ruben, did you want to say something too? Ruben Kigame. We have a comment from Kinshasa. A lady here says, uh, we invite you to Kinshasa for the months of August. Uh, hmm. So uh, there are reactions in the French. And some, someone wanted to add her comment as well, but I don't know how technically and if we still have time for that, but uh, yeah. I think we should wrap up, and, uh, finish in five, six minutes. So uh, we do have that notepad and I see people have started using it uh, and are writing their questions and comments and it is uh, it is probably LOD. Is it LOD? Yes, correct. It's okay. LOD. Is she online? She is. Uh... Uh, she is. She is listening to my translation. Yeah. Okay. But I've said totally different things than what you know. I'm just just joking. Okay. But can you, uh, Cedric? Can you bring her question um, oh. in? LOD, if. You can, uh, Elodie, si, tu, si vous pouvez me, me dire uh, la question, oh, can, can, est-ce que vous, bon, je, on va faire, on va, ok, we'll try like this. Mm. Merci beaucoup. So, Moi, je voulais juste vous féliciter. So, féliciter I want to, les... I want to uh, congratulate you. Thank you for letting me talk. Oui, uh, les questions, elles sont nombreuses. Je crois que nous aurons de l'espace, mais j'ai tout chaté. So, donc les, les questions sont nombreuses. De... Elodie, I need, I need to... nous nous je dois traduire. Elodie, je dois... si vous pouvez être plus courte, je dois oui. traduire. So, Pouvez-vous répéter peut-être je... Oui, je disais, à part les félicitations que nous réitérons, nous disons que euh, nous avons tout mis dans les chats. We, we have put, so we have put everything. There were a lot of questions in the chat that came from the French speaking group here. Mais déjà, sachez que nous vous invitons plutôt en RDC. Mais vous, Faites tout but, pour organiser cette conférence à Kinshasa en août. We invite you to come to Kinshasa for the conference in August. Et nous vous promettons que uh, toutes les associations vont collaborer. And et we nous promise, allons vraiment... We promise that all the associations will collaborate to that. Nous allons impliquer tous les partenaires et le gouvernement. And we want to also uh, involve all the partners and government as well. Et faire tout pour collaborer avec toutes les églises et les étudiants. And we want to do everything so that we can collaborate with churches, with students. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Wow. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that invitation. The team has to pray and think about this. Uh, I think that would be appropriate. Um, <clears throat> that is wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Elodie. Um, I would like to close us today. Uh, and um, I, I would like to point out a little bit what, what, you, what you can expect tomorrow. Tomorrow you will hear uh, Dr. Jillian Kassiri from uh, Uganda, and she will speak on the topic of hybrid education and curriculum development. So we will get a little bit more into the concrete form of how does this look like? How will it look like? We will also hear a, a lecture from Jason Benedict, 
who will talk about how is how could this be financed? I mean, quite a lot of you may be asking themselves, okay, this is all great, but we don't have any money for this. Uh, and uh, Jason will, will help us understand that this, is, th th this can be financed. This is really possible. Uh, it's, uh, and, and there is potential even in it uh, to, to really grow. Uh, and Jason has a wonderful lecture. He did have to record it. It's not, uh, he not, he'll not be speaking live, but this is, it, it's a video lecture that he gave with slides and it's really beautiful. So we'll have information and Frank will be leading us tomorrow as the moderator in the first part of the day. Uh, so he's a professor of bio nanotechnology. He has also already contributed and you have seen that he is pro proliferant, uh, very um, well informed about the situation in Congo and very, been very efficient in that country. So he has been living there for many years and knows the country and knows other countries in Africa very well. He has a heart for Africa. I can tell you that burns. You. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, you, you will have another lecture by Vishal tomorrow, if, uh, almost an, an hour. We reserved one hour for a lecture tomorrow to round it up. And uh, so don't miss this tomorrow because at the end you will see Bruce Friesen and Professor Vincent, you know, wrapping it up in the sense of call to action and how concretely can we get this really moving and what can we contribute to this uh, developing movement? How can we become part and what can we do to really, uh, to really get this going? So that's what I, that's all from my side. I thank you so much for and being here. Please. Is anything that I missed from the team? Yes, I would close this in prayer. Anybody else? Any other comments that need to be said now? Oh, yes. The chat will not be lost. We will save the chat just for anyone. Uh, and the questions, we will try to go through and maybe Vishal can incorporate some answers in the lecture tomorrow. Um, and so we will try to, to not lose anything um did you say that liz uh, liz is gonna lead us tomorrow as well yes i no i did not actually liz is going very to lead important. us liz is liz Gitonga from kenya is going to lead us as the moderator of the second part of the day tomorrow so she will uh, lead us to the end of of the summit and i'm very much looking forward to to her leading us here okay so if nothing else comes up i would like to pray with us and thank the lord for this beautiful day heavenly father Hallelujah. we want to thank Hallelujah, you for this lord, summit me. conference meeting Ish. um it would have been much much nicer if would we would have been together in person and i would have loved to meet many of the brothers and sisters that we have here in the room now in person not only virtually I uh, would have loved to talk and listen, ask questions. Um, but this time it was not possible. But still you blessed us with a wonderful um, opportunity to share this Zoom uh, conference. Thank you for all the input that you have given us today. Thank you for all the thoughts and uh, inspirations and some, some provocation maybe. Um, we ask that you guide us as we process what we have heard. Um, as we think about what we have heard and as we commit to what we have heard, Lord. Thank you that you can talk to our hearts, you can touch our hearts, and you can follow up with what has been said. Um, and this is all for your glory. It is not for us. It's not about us, uh, but it's about you. It's about your kingdom to come on this earth and about your beauty to be seen in the face of humans and um, people that you have created and the beauty to be seen in your church, the beauty to be seen in our nations and the glory of the Lord being raised up uh, so that Africa may become a light to the nations and to the other continents. We pray this all in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, especially to those in the US and Canada, I want to say this at the end, who are staying up 
Oh, Knight, Vishal, Bruce, David Glesney, uh, maybe some more. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you and have a good sleep. <laughs> go back to bed. Yes, go back to bed. <laughs> thank you, Shem. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow at the same time in the same room. You just click the link. Is that right, Shion? Yes, that's correct. Same link for everybody. Okay. All we'll right. see you all tomorrow. God bless you. Bye-bye, friends. Bye-bye. Andre Andreas, are you staying on a little bit? Or? Bye-bye.